what makes people react? Today, we're going to look at why it is that when we're having conversations, a number of people react in a certain way, and really what's triggering that. It's a very important subject. So the Reaching People Project, which can be found at reachingpeople.net, it really has three goals. It's to understand conversations and create open and honest conversations, to learn how to message correctly and effectively, and also to understand how we're influenced so we can protect ourselves and in the instances where it's ethical to positively influence others. So why do people react? So first, let's have a look at the typical conversation that we use on this project a lot with the two characters we talk about, which is Jane Bloggs and Joe Bloggs. And what we've talked about many times is that when they're in a conversation, effectively what's going on is that we stand on soapboxes. And the soapbox is really is a metaphor for the reservoir of information, memories, belief systems, our viewpoint. And we project that into the conversation. So effectively what will happen is that there'll be a box or a space where you know, the things that we say will enter and we will interpret these very uniquely. Now, what typically happens is that most people will see that the conversations that they're having over the last two years effectively have been like this. <clears throat> it's a game of table tennis. Now, David Bohm talks about this in his very good book on dialogue, that effectively, I think you could argue that all political debates are like this. There's never a point where someone will turn around and say, oh, the other guy's correct. It's really a game of trying to score points. And this is the way that a lot of the conversations are set up when we have opposing views. So we're effectively on opposite sides of the table. You'll know this will be the case that if you make, say, four very, very good statements, one of them has a little bit of wiggle room, they will focus on that one because the goal isn't in this sort of condition of conversation to reach the truth. The goal is to win the point. And whenever we're in that situation, it's almost impossible to have a very good conversation. And really, there's one, one point here I just want to weave in because it's really, really key. And Carl Jung really understood this, I think, that much of the evil in the world is due to the fact that man in general is hopelessly unconscious. The majority of the human race, not all of them, but the vast majority have good intentions, they want to be fair, and they want to live kind of a decent life, you know, at some level. Now, a lot of people where they're doing things that are quite negative or affecting others, a lot of it's unconscious. And yes, there is some ego stuff and, and very willful ignorance and a lot of those things. But even that itself could be characterized as a, as a form of being, just being unconscious. A lot of the time you'll find when humans become conscious of something that's not serving them, they can change, particularly, you know, and I've seen certain doctors recently where they've seen some data that's really shocked them. And it's really caused them some alarm. So it's just a point to, to, to hold in the back of our minds. So effectively, in a conversation, we end up with different perspectives. And what we're going to do is we're going to drill into this today. And we're going to look at why it's triggering people. So we have Jane and Joe. And we spoke about how they project their reservoir of information into the conversation. But how do they see things that are going on in the world? So what you have is that we have this represents a magnifying glass and any particular information or fact or data, each person is seeing it unique to them. And anyone that has a idea or belief that's not matching reality is not gonna see that information correctly. So if we look at Joe and we just hypothesize what's in his soapbox, he may be uh, say trusting of the media reports he may be of the view that the government serves him and, and serves a very useful purpose. He may think that, you know, social proof is very key. The majority of people, if they're doing something, it must be good. He may also think that certain things are safe and effective uh, and trusting of the information he's being told. And many, many people are, are under this belief that there's a consensus. And there's numerous articles, you know, the illusion of consensus, but consensus is very, very key in the way that it affects how we see things. So this would be Joe's perspective. And we look at Jane. Jane has almost a, a polar view where Jane thinks that there's just tons of censorship and anything on certain corporate media cannot be trusted. She knows that there's huge lots of conflicts of interest. Um, she knows that lots of the NGO, these non-government organizations have a lot of power. 
Um, she believes that media is a corporation and it's serving its corporate interests rather than the public. She believes or distrusts government. And she of the opinion that science can be, you know, persuaded and, and bought just like many other industries. So they're going to see every piece of information completely differently. And this is what's really astounding. If we are not conscious of this, even if we know about it, if we just don't become aware of it in a moment in time, you'll look at something and you'll think, oh, this must be exactly this way. This is how I see it. But the other person sees it completely differently. And, and it's kind of confounded sometimes. But we have to understand that each piece of information gets surrounded by hundreds of other pieces of information to give it meaning. And of course, we ask this question, how is the information in each person's soapbox being influenced? And there's a very interesting quote that says, if you're not controlling yourself, then who is? So it's it's really taken control of what's in the soapbox. And that's really the function of the conscious mind. It really acts as the watchman at the gate. But one of the problems is, is that the, the technology and the understanding of how we're influenced has become so advanced that it really is possible to influence people without their awareness or their consent. And this is where we're in very challenging times, but it's very, um, very sort of empowering times when we understand this information. So we're just going to look at Joe decision to go get a coffee, say, and we're going to look at this because it's going to show us some of the really important things that drive people's behavior. And then we're going to drill in to look at the needs. So effectively, Joe says he's, he's going to work. And he thinks, oh, I need a coffee. So, you know, he has a need. He has a thirst. He decides he wants a bit more energy, maybe. And so that sort of need of having the coffees will create forces and emotions to drive him to maybe visit a coffee store. And then when in the coffee store, he's going to be given certain decisions to make. And let's say that he already knows the type of coffee he wants. Then he's going to select whether he wants a small, medium or large. And that's going to depend on certain forces. Now, what used to happen if Joe went for a coffee is there'd just be a small and a large. And generally, Joe would choose a small and the majority of cases but now what happens is we generally have three options in most of these things because they know that the default method for most people is just to choose the middle route it seems the safest just as a default so then the coffee companies as i've mentioned a number of times they would move the small put in an extra large and then the the new medium is the old large so they make more money by the same token they can manipulate the price of the medium so then joe buys the large but of course, all of those things we've talked about a number of times. So what we're going to look at today is the really the first box is the need. You know, this first thing where the, the forces originate. And what's really important to understand is that when the needs originate, they then drive us to act via emotions. So first, we're just going to take a quick look at the role of emotions, which is number one, really to alert us. It's really like an alarm signal and for safety or opportunity. So if we're walking along and we sort of, you know, say 10,000 years ago, we saw something moving out of the corner of our eye, you know, we would be alerted by our emotions to take note of that. It might be very important for our safety. We might notice some sort of fruit trees in, in the distance. And so there's an opportunity for food. So the emotions really are this alert system there for us. And, and when we look at something like anger, anger is this, this, has every emotion has an action tendency and anger is to lash out to protect us so we have the emotions of a very critical role number two is they motivate us to act so they really give us that sort of movement material to go okay i'm going to go do this um, and number three they prepare the body so the body changes in response to what we're about to encounter if it would be the fight or flight so say fears triggered that we're going to have, you know, a lot of blood rush to our arms and legs. Rational mind's going to shut down. It's going to prepare us for what we need to do. And of course, there's this thing to also note that we're always moving towards pleasure and away from pain. It is possible to move to something that's going to give us pain if we think it's pleasurable and vice versa. So it's really the perception of these, not the actual that occur. So then... 
what we're really going to get into now is what's really key, I think, when we look at what's really driving people to do what they do. And it's really, this has come from Mark Leary's um, behavior course, which I think is really fantastic in, in summing up the research. And they've really come to this conclusion that there's five basic needs within a human. And number one is to be socially accepted. Now, when we think about this, how it's governed trends, fashion, choices of car, all of these things, it's such a drive for people to be socially accepted. And then what we see over the last two years with the narrative, it's played on this massively, you know, refuse nicks and, you know, selfish and all of these things is really pushing it socially accepted to the point where people, you know, change their profile picture every few days, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a real drive for humans to really be accepted. If we're not accepted, it tends to be, quite a you know quite challenging for us if people reject us it's very very painful at times we also have a need to be part of groups so we've developed to to move around in groups to to really form groups communities so this is really a deep need in people and again when we look at the last two years excluded from groups people couldn't you know go to choirs and social events and sporting events unless they complied so we, we really people were cut off from their groups Number three is to influence others. And really, predominantly, I think this is to make a positive impact on the world. And of course, then the ideology that we hold is very key. So then you see people that will adopt a new ideology. Very often, they want to sell that to someone else, even if they're not going to make any money from it, because it's really we want to influence those around us. And we have a very deep need to protect ourselves, to have safety within our lives. And to bond to a partner so what you see and obviously the safety one i don't think we need to discuss too much because the narrative has been 24 7 around scaring people and then giving the illusion of safety so these are the deep needs that really from our unconscious drives and urges we're looking to fulfill now what's happened with the way that we've evolved is that we're using sort of a brain now that's evolved for very different um lifestyle and circumstances we find ourselves in today so we've the brain's really adapted loads of the old uh, parts of it to to use in the new environment and and not all of them are perfect so what's possible now uh, in my opinion is that society has really learned how to provide the illusion of need really to meet somebody's want but not their need because in effect that tends to provide more corporate profit because by giving false fixes and compulsion loops the person buys something they have a short term of being happy the brain then thinks that's the solution if it doesn't fix it it then gets more so it really ends up being on this compulsion loop like a drug addict and what they showed with the studies with the mice where they would uh, sort of uh, connect its brain to a button where when they press the button they got the dopamine release the dopamine is really the hormone that signals you got what you wanted so then they kind of close the loop and then there's this, and it's actually not a, such a good feeling, but it, it feels like it's done something really needed. Now what happens is if that mice is just given that button, it stops living. It just presses the button until it dies. It doesn't want to go, you know, they put food and water in the cage. It doesn't go for it. So in fact, what's going on is that the magician's trick is giving the mice the illusion that it's getting what it wants but it isn't really getting what it needs so what you'll find is that historically our wants and our needs were connected pretty much like a railway track you know the wants being the left track and the right being the needs track but what's happened in modern society is that these have broken away they're no longer connected so we can get our wants met but not our needs so for instance we the sugar is one of the signals it's one of the signposts that there's nutrition in a food but it's now possible to take the sugar out of the food and put it into an empty vessel <clears throat> whether it be a cake or a chocolate bar or anything so you can literally now have the sign that there's needs there without the need being there and of course, we see this with social media for connection and social acceptance, et cetera, et cetera. Now, what we find is, is that when people get these needs artificially met, it then creates this compulsion loop and people go round and round and round. <clears throat> and of course, within the narrative, we, you know, safety was very much triggered and then it appears that all the policies that were enacted did not make anyone feel any safety. 
So therefore, two masks, three masks, four masks doesn't work. Two shots, three shots, four shots need more. Lockdown, lockdown harder. So you can see what people are doing is that they <clears throat> are given the answer to what they need, but it doesn't meet it. But there's not enough awareness to actually question. And this is what we tend to do as humans. Like if we talk and someone's not listening, we tend to talk louder, <coughs> thinking it's the volume that's the problem when a lot of the time it's actually the way that we're saying it so <coughs> excuse me one of the other things that i just want to bring in as well is this pavlov's dog and it really sort of this equals that so pavlov trained dogs to what he would show is if you would show food the dog salivates and then he hits the bell no response but if he every time he shows food he rings the bell it gets to the point where all the person needs to do is ring the bell and the dog will salivate. So this is really what's known as classical conditioning. And this really is the role of the media and advertising a lot of time. It's to tell us that this equals that. So it might be, you know, this car makes you feel good. And then people go, oh, I want to feel good. I'll buy that car. So it's effectively possible to actually condition people to think two plus two equals five. And whilst it would be ludicrous if you know that two plus two equals four, um, with classical conditioning, it really is possible to do many, many things. So if we look at this equals that, in this picture, the two people on the bench don't feel the need to wear a mask, but the other person does. So they're interpreting the situation very, very differently. And this is the point to make. It's very uh, uniquely interpreted the world. So now let's start to look at how this affects how Joe sees the world. So Joe's, one of his needs is to be socially accepted, Okay. And I think this, you know, is a universal need. A lot of people can transcend it, but it's really deep unconscious need. So, of course, all of this advertising, do your bit, <clears throat> is pretty much inferring that if you do this, you're socially accepted. So people changing their banners, people going out and clapping. Now, what's interesting, if people didn't go out and clap, there was almost the people would go, oh, why are you not doing that? So this, <clears throat> and this happened in the UK where, <clears throat> excuse me people who asked to go out on a thursday night at 8 p.m i think it was and clap to the sky to support the nhs so it was really uh what a lot of people suggested was a sort of a psychological piece to to get people behind the nhs but there was almost this if you didn't go along with a lot of these things then society was pretty much rejecting us and and that's obviously very key and a lot of people and this is why solomon ash's studies around conformity are very powerful because people want to fit in so if you have a large group of people doing something a smaller group of people can sometimes succumb to that pressure and it is quite strong and of course the likes is really you know intentionally playing on this so people really, you know, often measuring a lot of their happiness by how many likes they get, which is really become so artificial because every, everybody is really doing everything just to be accepted by someone else. And it, it gets into this crazy loop. And of course, <clears throat> kind of on a comedy thing is that pretty much everyone now is just, what, what is the current thing? Can I support it? Can I get acceptance from everyone else? Boom. So you get, you know, all these changing flags and whatever. And of course, if you point out, you know, <clears> that <throat> a different country has been invaded and uh, why they're doing that, all that's generally going to do is trigger cognitive dissonance. It will very rarely be met with a warm welcome. So the social rejection is very, very key because if we're getting socially rejected, it really, you know, and Mark Lee was showing this in one of the courses, <clears throat> it actually feels painful. You know, there's certain hurt feelings and people would describe this, you know, when they talk about being stabbed in the back or it was a, you know, punch in the stomach and all these things, they're literally, you know, describing a hurt feeling. So effectively, a little conversation, if any of the statements are, you know, you're wrong for a start is a rejection, COVID, sheep, you know, you're selfish, all of these things are effectively going to trigger the unconscious mind, strong emotions. <clears throat> because those needs are really being trampled on. And of course, the thing to point out is the, un, the, the emotions that surface, you know, if say Joe's been called, you know, been told he's wrong, he's not going to sit there and, and consciously calculate, right, that's bad, I'm going to get upset now, I'm going to get upset because she's not accepting me. It happens automatically and often, you know, far beyond his awareness. 
So this is when, when Krishnamurti said this, I think it's a very, very powerful statement, which is the highest form of human intelligence to observe yourself without judgment. And if we can practice that to other people, you know, because humans are fallible, we do make lots of mistakes. And of course, people are very vulnerable to influence. If someone has had a complete psychological job done on them and they're acting, you know, in a very strange way, by observing it without judging it, we can start to understand what's driving that, you know, complete nonsense in some instances. So the second thing is the part of groups. How is this playing into it? So we do have a need to be a part of group, to have communities. And of course, the lockdown really snatched all of those needs away from us. <clears throat> so, you know, we want to be part of groups, but then often what happens is that you have people that become an authority of that group or leader of that group. And it's really ingrained in us to listen to the authority because historically if we got excluded from groups it literally was life and death so these are things again if we're not conscious of can really be having an issue so this is of course when we see science as an authority <clears throat> we start to see the media's authority <clears throat> excuse me so you start to see that a lot of these things will trigger people unconsciously the authority stuff and you know the social experiments this guy really demonstrated this by walking into a park with a yellow vest on and a tan line, just telling people what to do. Most people just followed him. They didn't question who he was. Just some random guy on the street walking in and telling people what to do. So this being excluded from groups is so powerful. You know, it's where we see this social proof and this consensus really having a big part on people's um, opinion. <clears throat> so again, in a conversation, if you find someone saying conspiracy theorist, following the science, all of these terms, you know, refuse nicks are really this, <coughs> this part of groups, um, deep need that we have. And obviously on social exclusion theory, sorry, one moment. More specifically, Ballmeister and Tice proposed the exclusion theory of anxiety showing that the fear of being excluded from social relationships with deeply rooted and at a native base would rise and rise social anxiety. Therefore, social exclusion may disturb fear, learning and generalization. So this was pushed so heavily over the last two years where there were so many forces governing, governing bodies, companies, you know, groups, that was so forceful to force them to do things that it was pretty much fall in line or get excluded. That was it. You know, it was pretty hard on, on so many people. Okay, so then we look at the, the need for safety, which again is this deep need that we have. Um, you know, some people will transcend it and, you know, go bungee jumping and all sorts of things, but as a general need, safety is really there as, as a basis. So then you'll see people doing all sorts of things to meet this need, which again is part of the conditioning. If people are told this equals that, and they trust that without question, and trust me, there's loads of psychological manipulation to make that the case, people, if they're not conscious enough, are pretty much going to do anything they're told. Um, in the need of meeting safety, even if that safety is quite the opposite, you know, it's really about what they think it is the key question. You know, so when we look at a lot of the policies, you know, there's so many experts that would question any one of them. And I mean, if you look at this sign, this is an official sign, by the way, they used sheep as actually the time to measure how far away people should be. I mean, if that's not um, interesting, I don't know what is. So you'll see that this safety triggers such a deep unconscious need in people that, you know, once it's there, people are going to be craving this safety. And you know, it's really such a, as I say, such a deep need there. So effectively, when they're on soapboxes having this conversation, an angry tone will really come across as a threat to the other person and a threat to safety. Um, so that will really shut the conversation down. You know, things like, are oh, you jabbed? It's all trying to reach this safety and all these other needs. Um, even just not wearing a mask can actually trigger the need for safety in someone else. Um, because it, it comes across as a threat if the person thinks that's the case. You know, reality <clears throat> is kind of irrelevant because it's what people perceive of reality. That's the key point. So if we now look at what's going on in, in a sort of thing on the left, this conversation space, we have Jane and Joe on opposite sides. We talked about this table tennis. 
This doesn't tend to work. What we need, and we're going to look at this in future presentations, is that we're on the same side. We've spoke about how important this is because it changes the way we view things. And then the information goes into the space. Then what we've got to ask is the information we put into the space, what does this mean? If you say you are wrong, that is an attack on either person and that will trigger lots of things. So it's very, very key. We're going to start looking at how to enter the conversation space without triggering the other person. Okay, so in summary of today, emotions are an unconscious response to safety or opportunity. When they're being triggered, we can know that something has triggered it. And a big part of the project is understanding in order to get this rational conversation that we wish to have, we've got to navigate this obstacle course of all these landmines to not trigger the other person whilst at the same time not triggering ourselves, which is a big challenge and it's not fair, but it is the way that it can, it can allow us to reach people and, and have success. Uh, which I, I consider really the important thing. The public have been conditioned to think their needs are being met. That's why all of these things are happening. Happen. Uh, and then any statement that threatens the five needs will trigger a negative response. It's very, very key to understand this. So uh, just as a recap, the three things that we look at is how to have good conversations, how to effectively message, um, and we're starting to really get much, much deeper into this messaging now, which is really key, and how we're influenced. So thank you to those that supported us. It's obviously challenging times. Um, if you do would like to donate, please do so here. If you can support us, um, we have a, a paid event um, on Friday, 7 p.m., which is the How the Pandemic Was Sold. Uh, a lot of good information in there. And if you want to reach out, here's the email. All the presentations go on to the uh, YouTube channel and we'll go on to the website. 